In this interview, I spoke with Jim Brinker, President and General Manager of Intel Federal LLC, a wholly owned subsidiary of Intel Corporation established to allow Intel to conduct business directly with the U.S. government. Jim's career includes time at AT AT&T, Sony, and Silicon Graphics, and he's been named a WASH 100 award winner for the past three consecutive years. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also, we'd love to hear from you. If you have a question for the leaders of GovCon, please drop a comment below or email studio at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Jim Brinker, President and General Manager of Intel Federal. Jim, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Uh, It's my pleasure, and good afternoon, Summer. So, Jim, Intel is a manufacturer of semiconductor chips, which have created a lot of buzz in the U.S. government recently. Can you talk about how semiconductor chips are used in the public sector? Summer, it's it's an easy question because it's where wouldn't they be used? I mean, if you just think of yourself personally, um, where aren't you using a chip today in your life, your world, personal, professional, everywhere else? You know, the government is no different, whether it's, you know, just normal computing and the IT environment, uh, cybersecurity, those kinds of things. You know, you expand out to communications with 5G and mobility and some of the areas around satellite communications and things like that. Then, you know, clearly within the DOD, you have mission electronics and sensors and areas like that, but you can even expand out. Um, We're in the process of building the the U.S. exascale computer at Argonne National Labs in Chicago. And that is just a phenomenal machine that's gonna change the lives of so many people as you look at it. And it can impact healthcare and weather forecasting and all kinds of areas like that. And you expand out to autonomous vehicles and what's going on in that world. So if you really look at semiconductors today, they're they're incredibly important and they're only going to get more important as the future moves forward. So, Jim, last month, the Chips and Science Act was signed into law. Yeah, exciting. Very exciting. Can you explain what the CHIPS Act is and why it's so important right now? Well, the CHIPS Act, CHIPS actually stands for, you know, creating helpful incentives for the production of semiconductors. I had to read that part, but but if you look at it, it was $52.7 billion that the U.S. invested in U.S.-based microelectronics. So this is a a big deal and it's going to work through the Commerce Department you know, moving out, it'll be a series of grants to a number of companies to, to build out U.S.-based facilities and microelectronics. There'll also be tax incentives. And there's even uh, $1.5 billion in grants that are going to go to kind of enhance the 5G infrastructure. So when you look at it, you know, government incentives, you know, what, what they're doing now is they're really enabling our foreign competitors to have, have an advantage over U.S.-based microelectronics. If you go back to 1990, 80% of all chips were manufactured in the U.S. Today, 80% of all chips are manufactured in Asia. If you look at the U.S., you know, today we manufacture 12% of chips, only 12%, and Europe is only 8%. So that has to change. So the idea of the CHIPS Act was really to put the incentives in place to allow us to get to, you know, I know our our goal, you know, Pat Gelsinger's goal is that in 10 years, we get to a 50-50 environment, you know, 50 in in US and Europe, 50 in Asia, more of an East-West scenario, much more competitive. So how do you think the CHIPS Act will impact government contractors and more specifically, semiconductor chip manufacturers like Intel? How can we get to that 50-50 ratio? Well, well, clearly, when you look at chip chip manufacturers specifically, there's only three state-of-the-art manufacturers in the world, right? There's TSMC out of Taiwan, there's Samsung out of Korea, and there's Intel out of the United States. So from an Intel perspective, we really do see, you know, we are the U.S.-based chip manufacturer, and we see the incentives helping us continue in that, but really expand that role in the U.S. and beyond. But it's more than that. You know, you know, you look at 
at the, the foundry itself, it will help. And I'll probably talk about that a little bit as we go forward. But there's many processes within chip manufacturing. There's the design aspects of the chip. There's creating the, the original mask for the chip. There's the fab, and then there's assembly and test. So many of those right now are done overseas within that environment. What these incentives do is allow us to bring a lot of that back to the home, you know, home front where it belongs. The other thing it does is it really drives the ecosystem in and around us. You know, Heidi Shu um, with the DOD has talked about, you know, the lab to fab concept where the entire ecosystem will feed off of where the manufacturing takes place. So if we can build out a manufacturing plant in, say, Ohio, then we are able to build out the entire ecosystem. And they've already been contacting us in the state of Ohio about wanting to come in. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we want to have happen with this act. So we've been talking a lot about how the CHIPS Act incentivizes manufacturers to build these new fabrication plants here in the U.S. But that sounds like it could take years even. When do you think we can start to see the effects of these of this legislation and really feel the boost in our supply chains? Well, it's it's there's a twofold. You know, the reason we had to do it now is it does take three to four years to build a fab. You know, we start today. It's three to four years before we see that fab actually in production. And so we needed to start. But the reality is we've already started. And we're already underway in many of these things. We've got two fabs that we've announced in Arizona already in a broken ground on. We've got the Ohio fab that was just announced um, on Friday. Actually, we broke ground in Ohio. President Biden was there. Governor Mike Devine, CEO Pat, Pat Gelsinger were all in Ohio Friday. And they broke ground on the Ohio manufacturing facility and bringing silicon back to the heartland is what we're talking about. So things are beginning today with this. What the CHIPS Act did was really give us that incentive to know we, we you know, the government's got our back, the government will help within this environment, and we can start immediately in many of these areas, which we're doing. Well, Jim, congratulations on the groundbreaking of the Ohio fabrication plant. It was exciting. I'm curious, uh, we've talked a lot about CHIPS recently. Um, you mentioned 5G as well. What other emerging technologies do you anticipate could be most impactful in government contracting moving forward? You know, you, you mentioned a, a few of them. You know, I think 5G, you know, if you think of where we were just you know, a few years ago with, you know, 3G, then 4G, and now you got 5G kind of, you know, opens the door to autonomy and a few other areas. 6G is just on the horizon. You've got, you know, AI, and a lot of people are talking now of edge AI, and you've got the edge to cloud and edge to data center. So I think really bringing a lot of compute and intelligence out to the edge is what you're seeing a lot of companies, including Intel, really focused on. You know, from a mission perspective, if you think about it, that starts to open up things like smart cities. It opens up things like, like you know, a warfighter being able to get the intelligence you know, at, at the front line as opposed to back at a data center somewhere else. So there's huge advantages to it, but you need the technology to be able to do that. And that's where a lot of the, the things we're working on in these areas will focus and drive forward. Jim, what has changed in government contracting since you began your career? And what advice would you give to someone entering your industry today? You, you know, I, I thought you, you previewed that question to me a little bit. So you, you, you gave me a chance to really think about it. And so much has changed. You know, since I started my career, I started actually with AT&T, you know, uh, a number of years ago. And so much has changed since then. But a colleague of mine who is a, a graduate at, at Rice University sent me a, a video last night. And it was the 60-year anniversary, September 12th, 1962, which seems like a thousand years ago in some cases, but in other cases, it's not that long ago. President Kennedy gave a speech there where he announced the moonshot program. He announced September 12, 1962, that the U.S. would go to the moon within a decade. And with that, that announcement, that launched a series of technological changes that had never happened before. We've never been able to build a rocket ship that big. We never had the guidance systems. We never had everything that it took to get there. 
But the U.S. was able to do that and accomplish that goal. And I think about that to today. And where are we today? And some of the things that we're, we're looking at today, and you know, whether it's 5G to 6G, whether it's you know, AI going to neuromorphic, going to quantum computing, you, know, you look at autonomous vehicles and we've got the Tesla and some of the other ones today, but where will we be in 10 years when you look at that rate of growth? You look at energy efficiency and battery efficiencies and things like that. You know, all of those things, you start to think of the art of the possible. So when you really look at, at where are we today and where can we go, and you compare that to what President Kennedy was looking at at Rice University in sleepy little Houston, Texas in 1962, and you can really begin to bring home what could be done and what is the possible. So, so advice I would give is very simple. I'd be open. I'd be very open to change. I'd always imagine the art of the possible and where, where things could go and think long-term, think, think open that vision up. And then I would also be very passionate about whatever it is you do. It's not just a job, it's not just a career, you've gotta be passionate. I know that's something within the federal space, we have that, that ability to be passionate about the mission, about what we're trying to do. And I would recommend that to anyone as they go forward. So, you know, I know I got a little bit uh, preachy there, so I apologize for that, but I really, it was something that impacted me just in the last 24 hours, and I wanted to share that uh, going out. So thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Jim. That's very impactful. And uh, thank you for all the work you do at Intel Federal, and thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you for all you're doing. <laughs>